Um, it is great to uh, see so many of you in the room this morning, almost 40 attendees to this morning's leadership uh, series, Moving to Online Learning. Um, it is great to uh, have you join us from here in our uh, offices and living rooms of uh, the uh, Lincoln Intermediate Unit East, also known as uh, Ben and Jared and, and Nicole's uh, home offices. Um, this first of our workshop series is the beginning of what will be approximately three weeks of professional learning opportunities for each of your um, schools, districts, and um, educators. Today's first series, which is on the moving to online learning, is going to be focusing on the Learn On website tool, and I'm going to be driving us through that here today. And it's also going to be focusing on the, um, the use of the steps that are built in as leaders. We, we know that we've done an overview um, at many of the job-alike groups, but this particular um, workshop, which we're holding the entire hour for here this morning, is really going to be to focus on um, really getting into the nuts and bolts of the considerations that you need to think about. What we hope is, is that by the time we're finished here, you'll actually get in there and start scheduling with us for some office hours later this week, and we'll show you how to get to those here in a moment. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't at least first start talking about uh, the, the size of the team that we really worked on in either building this or actually delivering the content that is going to be coming up in the next three weeks. So as you can see here, we have a, a pretty wide um, breadth of team from EdTech Services, educational services, and special education that have, has helped with guiding the, the uh, direction that we knew that this toolkit needed to be able to provide. What we'll hope that you see as you go through with us today is that we've tried to give you what I would call really the um, kickstart guide of how to get your online program up and running in a, in a very short order. So the first thing is, is as we're you know, diving in here to the way that uh, this Zoom webinar works, I know this is a little different than what perhaps some of you may be used to in normal Zoom. Um, you're not seeing anything that's incorrect, um, just the size and the potential size of up to 3,000 attendees that our sessions will eventually grow to. Um, I, I think uh, you can understand why we need to make sure that we use the webinar room for this. Um, so those things will be disabled. Um, and aren't active. However, and I posted this in the chat earlier, make sure that um, as you are going in to uh, post any questions that you may have, if I'm talking, Ben and or Nicole will be going through the Q and A's and vice versa. We'll make sure that we're trying to address those Q and A's as we go through and take care of the actual um, things that you might ask us about. Um, one of the things that we are and we will allow for is if you do actually have a question that it would just be better served for you to um, ask the question using your microphone, just raise your hand. And as soon as we get to a good pause point, we'll go ahead and we'll make sure to unmute your mic so that you actually uh, can, can talk. And then the last piece is at the very end, um, while we actually are not going to do that for this particular session, it will be essential that you share with your educators that before they leave, they stay on for the Act 48 credit link that will get them out to, and actually you could probably do it too if you really want to and you need the Act 48 credit, that's totally fine. You can, you can fill it out and we'll make sure to complete that for you. But more importantly is to make sure that your staff fill out the Act 48 credit form so that when they click on that, it does make sure that it, um, it gives them the hours and many of your teachers may end up accumulating, accumulating quite a few hours. Um, ben, is there anything that I missed there or anything that you want, what you would rather, uh, you, or you want to make sure to go over? Uh, well, what we will be doing today is also offering Act 48 for this session and so that you'll be able to fill that out. And we do have an evaluation at the end that's going to be very helpful for us as we go forward. Uh, the evaluation isn't just to tell us how good a job or not that we're doing with these webinars, but also it'll provide you a quick place where you can tell us what other topics you'd like to see. So we encourage you to fill that out. It's, uh, it's, it is very short, uh, succinct, and then uh, it'll provide us uh, with the other topics that we might need to be doing. And especially since this is a leadership group, we can spin up some webinars for the rest of this week. All right, so, so oh, yep, sorry, Ben. 
well, as you can see, um, uh, we'll be archiving this webinar as well, and we can think about um, some of the changes that um, will need to be made. And you can also go back and view anything that you might want to. So as we turn our attentions to the changing expectations for online learning, one of the important things that um, the Department of Ed has been talking about is the continuity of education and um, what should be happening in that regard when we think about um, continuing the on the education of our students it's important that we we think about um, all of our students and so the free appropriate public education applies to online instruction so um, if a school is providing educational services that means you have to ensure that all students with disabilities have the same access now i will say that we got some guidance over the weekend from the u.s department of education that uh, really talk to the reasonableness of providing that types of the, the types of services that we're talking about and we understand that um, with some of our populations that it's going to be difficult to reach them and that doesn't necessarily when I say um, some of our populations we have to think not only about special ed and EL um, and and some of those populations but also populations where students don't have access or don't have a device um, or they don't, uh, you know, maybe they're a first grader and there's really <clears throat> no way for the, somebody to provide them with the instruction. We, we know that a first grader is not going to be able to uh, read an email from a teacher and then follow all the instructions to do all of their learning all day long. And so, um, so when we think about the population that we're gonna be serving, we really have to consider all of those students that, um, that will apply to online instruction. So, what you're seeing as we go through these first couple of slides is this is what as leaders you should expect every single one of your teachers to see in every single session we've decided that it is in, it really imperative that no matter how many or even if it's just one of the um the actual training webinars that your your educators might join us on we felt that it was essential that they hear continue to hear these in these introductory slides over and over again or maybe just the one time they join us they have to understand that this is about the continuity of education they have to understand that it applies to all learners and then they need to understand that there are some clear best practices and we've shared these best practices as an entire portal or an entire entire section rather of our online portal and in fact it is actually the best practices webinar is our leading webinar that we're going to be uh, launching next monday exactly this time on the 30th what we try to impress upon and what we're trying to impress upon you today as leaders and what we will try to impress upon educators is this idea of less is more um, we we realize that there is a, a standard bearer that many of us are are holding against that of which are the online courses that maybe your teachers who have adopted online learning or blended learning for your school districts ages ago by ages i mean of course like three to five years ago um, and so it's sometimes difficult to be able to try and put into perspective that when you have other teachers that have not developed even one lesson or maybe just one lesson uh, of online content that it is not going to end up looking like or being like nor should they be expected to be able to spin up for the remaining marking period again putting it into perspective for the remaining marking period that we have left it would take them longer than that marking period if they worked every day day in and day out just to try and get their content online let alone actually engaging and working with students so it's about setting realistic expectations and we're going to talk about those expectations in a minute when we get into the actual portal setting realistic expectations of what we think that your staff are capable of doing and what your students are capable of actually being able to consume in the in in the time limit that we're talking about so we try and give you some uh, elements here it's important especially that social emotional uh, element and i know we say sel but this is really just about social emotion as a human and understanding the idea of needing to be connected I, I, I told my team, we had a team meeting this morning at 7.30, and I said that uh, yesterday, I was, uh, my commute is about 45 minutes to an hour every day to get to work. And I said to my family, you know, I never thought I would miss having to drive to New Oxford to get to work. 
And they, of course, said the same thing. They wish I would go to New Oxford to go to work. But <laughs> the reality is, is that we all yearn and long for that human connectedness. So the ability, if not through a live virtual connection, like with Google Hangouts Meet or with uh, Zoom or any of those tools, it is important that your students still see that connection and, and then understand what is expected on them of them clearly. And um, if we can, if this really, this one slide um, would encapsulate everything that you would set as your expectations for your staff, I think this is a reasonable kind of checklist for them to follow and, and flow through. Okay, so as we go through and, and now dive into the actual webinar outcomes, this is what we see as really needing to be able to leave here in this leadership training, knowing that then we have our office hours open up that are able to actually then go into a little deeper dive with you as an individual entity. Okay, so we're actually going to be focusing mostly on the resources that are within the five phases of leadership. But we're gonna definitely wanna dive in and at least show you where the um, work is that we've developed for the teachers to be able to use as well. And then obviously, um, if we look at the student populations, you'll, you'll, you'll certainly have been able to identify by the end. I think Ben already did a nice job of starting to introduce who those are. Before um, we get started here though, I think it's important, and this is this wall of words. We, we typically, this is not our model, um, but this is probably um, the most important two paragraphs that encapsulate what I just shared about not expecting all of your staff to build out their own online school in the next um, two weeks. So take a minute, let's just take 30 seconds to just quickly read through the, the passage that's here. Okay, so what you can see clearly is the mantra behind the development of our portal is really action-based. That's one of the things that we are proud about of the work that our team has developed. We certainly, uh, we've seen out there, <laughs> probably if, if I haven't seen a dozen portals um, from all over the country that list the, your top 10,000 free sites or sites that have now gone free, uh, I haven't seen one. Um, and frankly, we don't know that those sites are necessarily the most beneficial because we're, we're, we struggle with the fact that we already have educators that have perhaps not had the expectation or the ability or the time or the resource, you name the reason, to be able to get their content online. And now we're going to throw a thousand resources at them and say, hey, go. So instead, we try to keep things very succinct, very step-based. And by step-based, what we're talking about is through five specific phases. So it is at this time that we're gonna jump out actually into the portal and we're going to look at the five phases of what we see leadership needs to consider as they are beginning to develop the work that your educators are going to be creating. So I'm gonna hop over there now. Ben, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add to fill any uh, dead airspace while I can <laughs> go over to there. If not, just we'll stand here awkwardly. Well, the one thing that I would add is that, you know, your educators are experts in their in their education face to face, right? They know what they're doing there. And the, the idea of these new tools means that they are going to have to learn a new tool just to be able to apply it. And so I think that when you when you start to work with your educators, um, they're all going to be at different places. They're going to need different supports as well uh, as they as they typically do. So just keep that in mind. Um, as you, you start to go through things. So right now you're looking at the website and um, uh, we're highlighting uh, uh, the front page here. One of the things that, I, that I'll point out, Jared was just showing you the, the calendar. So that calendar is being, up to, uh, is being updated often. You're gonna start to see some other webinars that we feel are from quality content providers like PAECT, STEM Connector, and then Kiker Learning. So we're adding those to the calendar 
so that you can inform folks. If there is a registration for those webinars, it's contained inside of the link there, just so you know. Um, and and that will be in addition to the content that we're providing. So uh, you'll start to see that. In addition, the um, registration, this is most important, probably the biggest question we're getting is about registration. Uh, please know that we are adding uh, a number of webinars um, to the schedule for next week. And so we expect that we will have registration open on Wednesday for educators. Um, so for educators, they will register by a Google form, basically going in and selecting all the sessions that they'd like to attend. And again, it just gives us a sense of how many people we may have in the room so that we can manage expectations. Um, in addition, you can schedule leadership office hours under the leadership meeting scheduler. So you, Jared was pointing towards where you see them on the calendar, but the blue link at the bottom there, that's where you go and click to get access to the calend Calendly, and then you can click on the specific date that you want. I believe they're all gone for today, uh, but if you click on another date, then you can see which time slots are still available. Um, and you know, again, some, some days have more hours than others. Uh, and if you really need something that's not seen there, then send an email to myself and uh, I'll work with our team to make sure that we get you set up with that. So um, with that, you know, we did the, the full tour, you know, we sort of gave the overlay, but uh, because this is the um, admin, the leadership uh, workshop, we're going to dive into the district leader uh, page and t uh, think about what those, those transitions are. So the short URL that you see that Jared is circling there is uh, learnon.iu12.org. So that's what you can give to anybody that you wanna give access to. Um, and by getting there, they're gonna get to the front page. One thing I'll say about the slide deck, we will post the slide deck as well um, uh, when we start putting our resources out. So if you wanted to go back, but a lot of those slides are placeholders um, for the conversation that we're gonna have from the website but you can feel free to make use of those slides if you need to present to your staff. So that's part of the reason why we have some of those things. So like this, that particular slide would be uh, nice if you plan on using our site with your staff that you can point them to, and you'll be able to just pull those slides off and we'll make them available to you. So at this point, I think we're gonna jump over to the district page. Yep, yep, we're going to do that now. And I don't see any questions in the Q&A yet, but again, I'll just remind everybody that as we do begin to move forward, don't hesitate to go ahead and, uh, and put them in there. So you'll notice the navigation at the top does have a drop down in addition to um, if you just simply click on the link. As we go into the strands of the district leaders, this is where you will see the five phases. And so as we get into operationalizing, where we're starting to actually identify what it is that we want our um, staff to be able to do by the time that they're completion and ready to deploy. These are all of the elements you need to start thinking about. And uh, you know, one of the questions that we were talking about even on, <clears throat> on site this morning is um, during our, during our check-in was, do we really think that our families know what's coming at them? <laughs> if we are saying, I mean, we're having all of these talks about, online learning and about mobilizing, but do our families really know what that looks like? Because what it does right now, frankly, I'm speaking from the perspective of a parent of a 16 year old that is in our house. She's pretty self-sufficient. I say that relatively speaking, but I can only imagine rewinding to kindergarten, first, second, third grade. What online learning means is that in the last week, They've been able to, and when I say they, parents have been able to essentially schedule their child in activities to keep them busy, maybe put them in front of uh, some Netflix for kids <laughs> a little bit, but it's going to change completely as they're trying to balance. And this is why less is more is also an important element. Our parents are going to have to become educators, especially of the littles, the students who are in that K to six group they're not gonna be able to engage in the learning that we're sending home like they would when you have a full-time educator who understands learning theory and understands how students are, are you know, progressing. And so because of that, 
you need to remember that this is going to change their lives, many of which, by the way, are trying to balance the same as you, working from home and having to get their jobs done because their employers are asking them to complete as much work as they can in this very difficult time. So we are all going to have to balance the elements that are, um, that are a part of this. But have we communicated yet to families what that's going to look like? That's gotta be a part of this expectation continuum. It can't just end with student expectations. Okay. I would just add that that's one of the reasons why we talked about less is more, that we want to continue when we think about continuity of education, the educational process for students, and there's going to be a learning curve for students to learn how to learn this way, and, and we recognize that, and so um, the pacing at which we work is going to be a little bit different. Uh, if you've ever taken an online course, you know that there's a learning curve just for that. And typically, a lot of those courses start with a face-to-face -face component where you can explain and point things out and ask questions. And that's not going to be possible here. So, um, and, and I, Ben, if I don't, I just want to interject because um, there's a question that came in the chat that we're going to answer. Uh, I'm going to say an answer here. We do provide a parent and gear, caregivers portal that's over here on the right-hand side. And we're not going to really dive into that today. We gave this for you guys to share these resources as you wish. We realize that not, you may not point your parents right to this one page. You may actually do that. Um, but this is all built on Google Sites. So it actually is completely mobile adaptive. It would look fine on an iPhone um, for them to be able to see these resources. But we did put them here. Um, and they do give some tips about how to balance all the way down to, we actually included, in addition to uh, tips for helping your learner at home, which this is a great, um, Vicki Davis is uh, on her Twitter handle is Cool Cat Teacher. Um, this is a great video on that, but we also provided a nice common sense media newsletter that talks about how to set up schedules with parents, with your children as a parent. Um, so, so definitely some great resources there for you to share. Sorry, Ben, that, I apologize. That schedule. That schedule actually talks about <clears throat> uh, physical education, you know, and getting kids outside and doing things. And when you think about what happens at the school day, you know, parents uh, may not necessarily remember all of the different types of things that happen in a school day. And so that one document uh, is going to be extremely helpful for you to give out to the parents to say, please remember some of these uh, things that we do, you know, kids have recess and they have breaks and they, you know, we build those things in. And um, although parents went to school, they're probably not experts in school. All right, so let's go ahead and scroll down um, and start diving into each of the individual steps. So I'm not going to call this out on every other slide or every other um, part of the site. But you'll notice that there are no more than about, I think, the largest number of steps we have on any one phase uh, for educators or, um, or administrators is like five. But in most cases, it's like three or four. We try to really chunk it and keep it as simple as possible. Does it mean we may have missed something? Possibly. So actually, we probably should have pointed that out. If there is something that you think is missing on the home page, what we are going to ask you to do is you can post the questions here. When we released this to the actual job alike groups, we had a feedback forum that we had them provide. We, we didn't put the feedback forum on here because we didn't know right now, this has reached, this site has reached over 2000 individual users. We don't necessarily have the capacity right now to get feedback from anybody who goes to the site. So if you, we're just telling you now, if you have questions or something that you think could be of benefit to be added to the portal, we're gonna just tell you to add it to the FAQs. You can also add any of the questions you may have about moving to online, and we'll make sure that those get posted to the Q&A. Sorry, we, we, I, I completely missed that as I was uh, scrolling down there. So as we look at this first phase, um, and we're not going to dive into these uh, in, in a lot of depth, but enough to make sure that we touch on the elements of why we included it. Um, we provided a, a sample telework policy for staff. You know, it, it, again, this goes back to the, uh, the idea of I never wished uh, more to be able to drive a 45 to an hour commute. Um, who would have thought in education that you needed to have a telework policy? 
Um, I mean, in a traditional working environment, you got to be where your kids are. And so what we've done is tried to make this easy for you by creating and developing steps of things that you want to make sure to consider. Now, I, you know, when you think about it, what are the things that you have to talk to your employees about? They might not understand that working from the sofa every day where the big, you know, Great Dane might jump onto the laptop um, may not be the best conditions in which to define where you're going to work. Defining the schedule that they're going to follow, defining what they should be using with regards to technology, the security of personally identifiable information, all of the things that come along the lines of workers' compensation claims. Now they are working at home. That is their workplace. If you're expecting that they are providing virtual services to, to, to learning, you have to make sure that you provide guidelines for them. So um, moving down through then, what you'll see is that we also include the FERPA and HIPAA compliance of Zoom as well as Google Hangouts. Make sure that your teachers understand this is a great way to expedite getting content to students if you have students who can join online. And if they can, remembering that FERPA only as, is as compliant as the tool itself. The tool may be compliant, but if your educators create a situation where personally identifiable or confidential information is addressed through the Zoom and there's other, or the Google Hangout, and there's other students in the room, that means there's other families that are in the room. So it just completely changes the dynamic, in which case you may want to adopt a, this live streaming policy, understanding that if you don't actually have the ability right now, because I know a lot of board meetings have been canceled, I know a lot of board meetings have been made to be virtual or to be just shells of themselves, if you will, what we would suggest is turning these live stream policy um, guidelines into perhaps a family sign off, understanding that they are um, going to be working in an environment that is different than what it once was, and that it is imperative that they preserve confidentiality. Jared, I just wanted to quickly add that one of the other things about all those free online tools is that some of them um, specifically do not apply to students that are under the age of 13. And so, you know, it's very easy to look at something and say, oh, well, we're going to just make use of that tool. Um, on our pages that, that call out a tool, we have linked in the terms of service. And so, so we advise you to make sure that you're reading about those as you make decisions because your teachers are going to come to you and say, we want to use this product. And you know, then you wanna be able to go back and look at the terms of service so that you can make sure that it is going to be compliant with the age group you're using it with. So the next step is then to um, think about your virtual um, professional learning plan. And so um, we, we've talked a little bit about how these types of things can happen. And um, there are tools that you can make use of um, that, that can sort of help that. Uh, so when you consider how you're going to deliver the instruction to your staff, you know, there's, there's these options to do it synchronously and there are options to do it asynchronously. So, you know, synchronously means you're doing a webinar similar to this. You have all the folks uh, online. And one of the things that I can say when we're doing it in this format, you know, and you, you know, you can see, you know, what's in the background here, but you, you know, if you have 50 staff members on or more, um, you can't really be seeing who's paying attention when they're in the room, you know, who's answering emails, uh, who's doing something else, um, you know, whether they're actually present with you. So, so consider that as a part of the online professional development. Now, when you talk about archiving, your staff can go back and they can look at things and you may want to think about how you're going to make sure that they've, they viewed it and not in a compliance way, but in an actionable way, thinking about, you know, what are the actionable steps that I can take after watching this? And what are the questions that I have? And you have to be very deliberate in, in how you do that because otherwise you can spend, you know, you can get lost in the YouTube channel where you're just watching webinar after webinar after webinar and you're not actually doing anything um, to, to comply with it. So we've tried to keep, <clears throat> as Jared said, these steps slim and numbered because those types of things help folks to, 
to focus in on what they need to do and then give them those actionable steps after they've completed something. We've already talked about then making sure that your parents are prepared. Notice we have that in phase one. We, we honestly, it's, it's all for naught if you only let your parents know by the time you get to the deploying stage. If you are not starting to think about the operationalizing and letting parents in on the plan, because that's really all they can ask for and all they really want. I mean, as a parent, I want to know, is my school at least preparing to be able to deliver online instruction? And so that may be the time that you point them to your parents and caregivers resource. It may be the time that you ask for um, them to review your policy on video conferencing and live streaming. Um, you know, it, it, the question came up of how do we acknowledge or how do we get acknowledgement? I would ask you to call back upon how you get sign off on your student handbooks. If you still have parents sign off on a physical paper, it may be a time to have them actually use a Google form. Um, the uh, paper, Paperwork Reduction Act of 1994, um, back with President Clinton, um, allowed for electronic signatures, yet we still push paper all over organizations. Um, so one of the things that I would suggest is thinking about how you could possibly make that sign off be them simply using as their signature something to identify that it's them their first name, their last name, and their signature is maybe their email address, something unique, okay? So just something you wanna definitely consider. So Ben, do you wanna dive us into the Oreo process before we go into the, and actually the warehouse as well? And then sure. I'll talk about Alan's solutions as well. So we, um, one of the things, for all of your schools and for, for all of your teachers, my guess is that they all have some type of format in which they're completing their lesson plans. But now that you're going to be changing over to online instruction, uh, we wanted to um, adopt something that we thought might be helpful. And the OREO framework, which stands for um, Objective Responsibility Expectation Organization, uh, comes from Allison Yang. And we've taken that resource and we've adopted it uh, excuse me, adapted it to another format. So Jared's clicked on the link so that you can get more information if you want to dive into this. we One thing that, that will be important, you don't want to create work just for the sake of work. So if you have lessons in a, in a format, I'm not suggesting that you have to change those, but you do need to think about these four pieces um, that are a part of online learning. And so calling them out in some specific way. Now, if you don't have a framework, um, this can be one where you can create some consistency for that. And on the teacher page, we have links to a template for the lesson plan that goes with this. So um, there's a, a, a daily template and a weekly template. And the weekly template might be one where you can, you can start to think about uh, what those will look like. The next piece is, um, is establishing your digital content warehouse. And so when we talk about a warehouse, we're talking about the place where you're going to put all of your digital content. Now, when we think about a learning management system, you may already use Schoology or Canvas or something like that. And if your teachers are already familiar with it, then that is your warehouse. But in some cases, you don't have all of your teachers in that, in that LMS. Or you may have a situation where they're using multiple products, which could include Google Classroom. What we're suggesting is that you want to create sort of one place where um, parents can access all those resources. So think of this as a directory. So it could be as simple as a Google Doc that lists all of your educators and has a link out to where their content is. Because if a parent has three kids, one in third, fifth, and eighth grade, your materials could be in lots of different places and you wanna make it easy for somebody to find where it is, that one-stop shop. Can and I so, chime in there a minute, Ben? Yep. Um, so this is where it separates district leaders from educators. While we might tell the educators this, um, exactly the way that Ben shared. Now let's, now let's hit the, uh, the, the topic where it meets the road. Um, you may have teachers who are going to get very seriously ill. And if you do, you need to make sure that that directory allows for coverage of one another. 
So you may want to think about, especially if you have multiple levels of the same course. I realize that when they left the marking period three, they might not have all been at the exact same spot. You might have at least three grade three, grade four, grade five teachers in your building. You may want to consider having them work together now for this last marking period to create coordinated content and coordinated class lists. Because if you do that, if one teacher falls ill, you still have two that could keep the class going. Rather than trying to scurry and realize, oh my gosh, Mrs. Miller was allowed to create her biology class on her own, and Mr. Wilson was able to do the same thing for his, and now Mrs. Miller's sick, well, how can we overlap them? So you wanna think about those things so that as we move forward, it's, we, we ourselves fell into this, of talking about just the, committing to do three weeks worth of webinars, it's easy to do when we were all feeling healthy and well. You gotta make sure you consider that as you're moving forward. And that <clears throat> setting that up from the very beginning allows for, uh, for you to have those links. So, you know, even though every teacher will be listed, they'll be linking into the same, same place. But it also, the other thing about getting your teams together, first of all, it'll help your team in terms of the SEL approach to their team because they're gonna be um, able to work together. And second, it also allows uh, for the coverage. So, you know, behind the scenes, we have a team that, that, are, that is working on things. So um, even, you know, when we think about this website, perhaps it's Nicole or Jared that's taking care of something. Um, that that can also affect this. And one other thing that I would mention about the team, um, and, and we did this with, within our little group here, is that we had to agree right up front uh, on some norms. And, and part of that was almost the pinky swear that we're not gonna complain about work that somebody else does. Um, you know, Jared- Somebody broke that pinky swear within the first, uh, I think, two hours of that, of that commitment. <laughs> right up front right because because what happens is you know Jared does things differently than I do and Nicole does the same and you know we're trying to get stuff to to work in here and we're working quickly and so we just have to be willing to accept that and you know when we're face to face and we're, we're able to sort of plan and work things out then you know it's a different set of norms than when you're working online and so I think that's one of the things you'll also want to establish with your um, with your uh, staff so the, the digital warehouse is going to be that place where you're going to host all of that content. One of the things I would just quickly add about this before we dive into the remaining steps here in the, uh, this, this early phase is that um, if you find that you don't have the capacity to spin up course content for the remaining marking period, we have linked the resource that um, Alan Moose, who is our supervisor of online learning, um, he has um, partnered, well, we already have a partnership with Edgenuity and Odysseyware and Odysseyware Academy. He has partnered with them to provide several structured options, one of which is a full access to all courses, and it's a $2 per student for four weeks. So if all you have to do is get through two marking or two months or one marking period, what you might be looking at is at most $4 per student, which you might think, okay, that's pretty hefty. If I have 3000 students, it's $12,000. Okay. But if your $12,000 eliminates 227 teachers from having to all get content online where there is none, you may want to consider that because then all you have to worry about is figuring out, I say all, then all, because we're in the same boat, we together have to figure out is how to get that content to your students and how to train up your teachers to use that online courseware to be able to matriculate students through the content. That matriculation is a tricky one because clearly um, I've had, I was fielding questions all weekend long and several came up that were around the idea of attendance. The, the, the frankness of it is we don't have a clear answer. We have our own experience. Um, I will tell you that we are one of the most stringent um, and, and um, I would even say well-respected attendance models in our Lincoln Cyber Cafe's Lincoln Edge program, which is a full-time online school. Um, we have very clear guidelines about the number of minutes each student must be on each day 
and how much they must be completing of their work each day. There's two clear metrics there. Uh, that's not gonna be the case here. You're not gonna have online statistics. You're just not, unless you have an online um, tool that allows you to do it. And um, you're not gonna be able to determine necessarily by artifact um, how much time it took a student to complete that work. So we're gonna submit, or we have submitted our um, guidance, asking for guidance from PDE, but I don't know that I would expect much. Um, I think if you, my recommendation at this point is developing content that would demonstrate based on the rigor and the amount of content, how much time would be expected, and then students' completion of that work would be helping to inform the attendance um, assignment of that. But again, the department has been silent so far on that. I don't mean that in a negative way, I just mean that they have not provided any issue or issued any uh, guidance on that that we have been able to find. Um, so as, go ahead, ben. So as we think about like moving into some of the other areas and thinking about the need to support um, all students, we know that that <clears throat> for special needs students, it's going to um, look different in terms of their online work than it may for, for other students. And so we're actively in the process of looking at how that, that might be conducted. And I think we're in a place where we're going to need innovative ideas in order to support staff. And I would just, I would just mention, um, I told Jared this morning, Butler Area School District this morning is starting to work with their students via radio. And so um, uh, we have, we've heard from a couple of schools that are going to be using TV to be able to uh, produce content for students. So it, we're going to have to make some adjustments. We have special pages for right now for special ed, uh, for uh, EL learners, and for gifted students. We, are, we also want, as district leaders, for you to recognize all of your staff and think about how each of those staff members can be contributing and the fact that even though they may have been doing one thing maybe they have to pivot to doing something else uh, to be able to support the cause i mean we're looking internally and we're saying okay well you know i know that this person's regular job was one one thing but now we are going to need support in another area and so think about your school counselors your nurses your reading specialists and, and please know that we are working on developing specific pages targeted towards those specialist types of jobs uh, that you have, and we will have them up on the website as soon as we can. Uh, I would expect um, probably about midweek um, for, for some of those additional pages to be pr present. On and that's the our tech staff that are working on helping us develop that, correct, Ben? Yes, yes. So for us behind the scenes, it's a, it's a team effort. We actually have some pages that are hidden away. We have a page specifically for each of the PDE initiatives. Uh, so if you think about autism and MTS act, academic and behavioral supports and all the types of places where our TAC are working, they are now um, engaged in helping us to pr provide content. Those pages should be, uh, I'm going to say, uh, you will see them up on, uh, probably tomorrow. And, um, and so we'll try and also find a way to highlight some of where the, that information is going. So when you come to the front page of the website, you'll be able to see, oh, there's new information here that you can go find. One of the elements that before we dive into the next section um, that <clears throat> has been going around, and I don't have a great answer for it, and um, it's something that we probably should have in thinking about this now, um, I'm going to make my own recommendation to my own form if that's okay um we probably should have added some elements of thinking about how you're going to get devices to students because if we're talking about faith let's go now into the converting phase um i want to drive i want to go back to the the slide deck a minute to show you the graphic that we implored here um or employed here so when you think about getting your staff what they need the idea of inclusive practices can come from on the website under educators considering all learners. This includes our webinar series. How to get the content converted digitally comes from either the live or the recorded sessions that we're going to be doing with face-to-face -face instruction like what you guys are in right now. And so if we come here to this conversion steps, this is truly now for where your educators need to actually meet each of their students needs. The problem is, is that 
and this is where I'm joking about needing to add another, another step or at least another group is what about those students that don't have, it's not something that we've, it's something that we've talked about countlessly, but I don't know that we have a great answer for it. In fact, the superintendents are really struggling with, with this as well to try and think about, we've been great at getting lunch depots and getting check, pickup points for students to come and get their meals. That's a very different thing when you have 3,000 iPads sitting in, a cla in classrooms that don't typically go home. And now, how do we get them into the home? Oh, but wait, we need to include the tech department because all of those iPads have a profile on them that don't let them work on any other Wi-Fi network other than our own. So when we think about that, it's really important that as we go from this idea, oh, excuse me, as we go from this idea of taking and, and, and moving from the actual development of the um, parameters for how we're going to design instruction and who we're gonna focus it on, you gotta remember that FAPE is not just about special populations. Today, where connectivity is as ubiquitous as, as, as electric and heat and water and sewer, um, in some families it's not. And so FAPE actually uh, applies even in that case. So go ahead, Ben, this is where you were talking about the templates. I know I was trying, when you were talking, I didn't want to interrupt you. I was kind of circling that yeah. we did put them here as well. So a couple of things here on the mobilizing. One is you're going to need to establish those clear expectations and communication channels, and you might need to consider how you're going to do that because, you know, uh, for us uh, as an organization we're, or as a team, you know, we use a, a messaging tool called Slack, which allow, you know, uh, so as opposed to having like a large text chain, you know, we can set up channels that we can focus our conversations on and we can conduct that type of work. So again, you're going to have to think about like scheduling daily meetings to check in. Maybe they're going to be in small chunks. And so you may have to set the expectation. We're going to have a 10 minute meeting and that way, and it's going to literally be 10 minutes where I can check in and I can see people and I can get questions and then providing them that, that, type of resource and you can do the same type of thing that we have with an FAQ set up a Google form and allow your educators to submit those questions to you so you can start to get that information as opposed to emails that go back and forth and back and forth and can balloon up your, your mailbox you really want to create that uh, strategy for how you're going to talk to people and get information back and forth and as Jared mentioned the templates are right there for you to use as well that would be another thing that we could discuss during one of the leadership meetings is how can I spin up a communication strategy for my district very quickly? Well, and, and that communication back and forth, Ben, um, you know, you, you may not have gotten this question yet, but as leaders, you're gonna, your students or your uh, parents right now, if they need to talk with a, uh, a teacher, now they may call the office, they may dial an extension, and while that's all well and good, and you might be fortunate enough to be in a district that has um, your uh, web-based or software-based phones that are right on the laptop so that it rings the teacher's laptop instead of a phone on the wall, but I'm going to bet of the 10,000 classrooms that are in our footprint, that probably is this many. <laughs> um, the rest are going to have to try and scramble to figure out when you, have a t when you have a parent that does need to talk to a teacher, how's that going to work? You're I'm sure your, your teachers are not going to be uh, pleased about sending out their phone numbers to all of their, their uh, parents to be called at all hours. Um, have you taught your teachers at least to, do to dial star six seven before sending out a call or before actually making a call? Because what that does is it blocks caller ID. There's one effective way to at least make it so that they can call out. However, one of the things that you may want to consider is under four educators, what we have is under our free online tools, Zoom is now free for educators for an unlimited sized room. And why that's important, or an unlimited length room, I mean. So they've essentially lifted the 40 minute time length to be able to allow for all of your teachers to perhaps be able to communicate that way. You may say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't help me because I already said my parents, I don't know if they have web access. 
That's the best part. They don't need to have web access because Zoom will give your teacher an actual phone number and a meeting ID. So essentially, they could, they could email the parent and say, I tell you what, we can chat at 3 o'clock on Wednesday, call this number and dial this nine-digit pin. And it actually will work just like calling into a political open uh, discussion that some of our local legislators do. So you can work around some of the issues, but you got to think ahead. Um, now that we don't have Google Voice as an option under the um, Google Education Suite, Google took that away. Ben, did you want to say anything more about the templates, or do you want me to click on them and go into them at all? I didn't. Well, the the thing about the templates, I think, are just there. These we provided these to help you if you need them. Um, the we. You know, one of the things about these steps, and, and I haven't seen this in a lot of places, but again, uh, I'll just, I think it's worth mentioning is that when, you're, when you move to online, you have to have clear, consistent communication. And one way to do that is to number things. Do this, do this, do this. When you're a teacher in the classroom or an administrator in a meeting, you can walk around and you can talk to people and you can find out what they're doing and where they might be going wrong and steer them back. When you go online, you can't do that. And so that's why the templates are there. I think I'd just let you explore those on your own uh, for time's sake. And, and then if we need to come back to them, um, we can. And again, you can email us, submit an FAQ or schedule a leadership meeting with us to, to dive a little deeper into it. Uh, so I think, you know, when we think about um, the conversion steps, I did want to talk just a moment. If, if, if you go right back where you were there for a moment, thanks, Jared. The idea that, that for how you can work with your teachers, because they're going to have questions when they come to you, you know, uh, one of the, the natural reactions is to throw up our hands and say, I have no way of doing this. In fact, I talked to a chemistry teacher over the weekend. And he's like, how am I going to do labs? And I said, well, there is a way. So, you know, like actually, if Jared scrolls down, you'll see at the bottom, uh, you know, under under labs that we can, um, there are some websites that allow you to um, to, to take a look right there. Um, there are two tools, uh, FET simulations, which are always free, and Explore Learning Gizmos, which have turned free, which allow you to do a, a virtual lab. It's not perfect, but it's a, it's a good fit for an online virtual environment. And so, the way you use this is the same way Jared talked about. You look at the left column and you think about, okay, this is what I already do. And, and as leaders, you should think about this as well. What do you do with your staff now? I hold meetings, uh, I have one-on-ones, and how are you gonna conduct that in this now online space and how will that happen? And I think part of that can be looking for the right tool as opposed to going to a list of a thousand tools and picking one that looks great. Okay, the first thing is think about, okay, this is what I'm already doing, and I need to do this, and then looking for the right tool that matches up with it. And, and while we're not going to necessarily go into that, it's actually structured in our um, work here. When you go to these uh, locations of each of the steps, we actually have them, Ben and Nicole worked really hard this past week at, at really structuring each of the tools categorically under the educator tab. Um, so what you're seeing there is just kind of a snapshot, this kind of categorical breakdown of the face-to-face -face approach type and how that gets converted into a tool. They did that not only by approach, but they also did it by content area, right, Ben? You guys have different things broken down by different subject areas to make it a little less unwieldy if you've been a recipient of that Google uh, sheet that has been going around that's now up to about a thousand rows of, uh, of content that's free now. And that's an important distinction. There are two things. There are tools which allow you to get work done, and there are the content resources because, you know, maybe your kids took all their books home, but even if they did, getting them to, you know, read this or read that, there are online tools like Discovery Education that have rich content that are um, going to be able to be used in an online format. So we've broken it out into those two pieces, and you'll see that under the, the four educators that there are free online tools and there's online content resources. This so, is, and, and I'll just chime in finally here, is that um, this was probably the hardest part for us to be able to 
independently to determine how to help you as a district. We recognize your staff are going to need this training. My wife is an English teacher in one of our school districts in our footprint. And fortunately, she understands how to use these tools. So we've been balancing the office use while she's recording pre-recorded webinars. Um, and I accidentally come busting in the room and get the, the glare that you can imagine I equally deserve. Um, those, those things are just kind of naturally occurring in my household. However, I don't know how you in your own district have prepared for resources. One of the things that I will share is while we definitely are giving you the face-to-face -face virtual trainings, we definitely are giving you the webinar access after the fact. What we heard, I think if we didn't hear this a dozen times, is please make sure to include your coaches. Sometimes they get missed because they're part of your, you know, kind of teaching staff and they might not be always in leadership team meetings because they are part of maybe your teaching staff. Remember, they are just chomping at the bit to help. So start, if you have not reached out to your coaches to talk to them, now is the time. And during this conversion step, you're going to need to count on them because there's only so many webinars that we've been able to set up. Even though it sounds like a lot, three weeks worth of webinars is not a whole heck of a lot when you're looking at the spectrum of everything that your staff may need. So don't forget to include your coaches. If you don't have a coach, try to tap into those teacher leaders who you know have been working hard for, you know, in your school district to already start doing some of this work. And, and just going back to the idea of taking attendance, <clears throat> if you're looking at how do I track what my staff is doing, uh, one of the ways is that when they complete a webinar, whether it's live or recorded, they will be given a, a chance to fill out a form. And the form does ask for the actionable steps. And we can provide that list to districts so you can see who is at least reporting out that they're watching these webinars. So then um, you get to the next part about deploying. And when you get to deploying, it's about con communicating those consistent expectations and also checking in often with educators. So with my team, each day uh, last week, I was making sure that I was reaching out and talking to them and, and thinking about things, uh, even for my, my uh, admin assistant, you know, normally when I'm in my office, I walk out several times a day and I talk to her. Well, you know, now I'm in a situation where she can't Zoom either. She's in a, she's in a place where she doesn't have access to Zoom. So that means, calling her up on the phone and talking to her and saying, you know, just seeing how she is doing. And you can see a lot of that. You know, one of the do things I do like about Zoom is I can see the face or if I'm listening and I'm talking to them, I can hear those, the, the tone of their voice, those types of things. And um, for those that know Jared and I really well, you know, we're not necessarily touchy feely type of people, but we recognize that when you move to the online um, format that we need to keep in mind the social emotional needs of both our staff and our students. And so um, we're making conscious efforts to, to make sure that, that people are doing that. So when you think about going back, checking in with your educators, making sure that they have professional learning opportunities that they need that will fit their opportunities and, and where they are at the moment, and then thinking about their social emotional needs and checking back with them, I think that's going to be the, the pathway to success for all schools in this regard. You know, one of the things that I've been seeing school uh, administrators doing is um, sending out morning thoughts. Um, it might be something that you typically would have done in your normal course of the day, um, you know, during morning announcements, you might have somebody designated for that. I think it's essential during these times to have something like that. For us, it's, it's, it's kind of cheesy, but every morning we go into Slack and we say good morning. Um, just enough to get everybody kind of on the same page and recognizing they're not alone and your teachers are going to need that and it's going to need to be more than just action steps because if all they're getting and hearing from you as school leaders is you need to do this today, you need this by this date, you need to attend these trainings and not recognizing that there is a human on the si other side of that email, um, it, it can be something that quickly isolates your staff un, un, um, intentionally. So um, just make sure that that's something that you're thinking about as kind of a final deploying step. 
Um, as we go back to the slide deck and wrap up here for today, we would want to just remind you that all of the trainings that you've been able to see and take part in here um, today, like the, those that you took part in today, are all going to be available in the same, the same medium and format. I hope in this hour we were able to at least give you a deeper dive. I know that when we were in our job alike groups, we really glazed over all the steps pretty quickly. I hope that this sounds a little bit less daunting, being able to um, go through and make actionable the steps that you're working, on, working through. And just again, as a reminder, please schedule those trainings with us. Um, and we would again ask you to please participate in our evaluation. And it's just bit.ly slash learn on web eval. Um, and that is case sensitive. So you got to make sure that you have each of the learn on web evals um, capitalized. And so when you are redirected from this webinar, however, it is going to take you to the uh, Act 48 credit um, selection so that you actually could get Act 48 as well. And that's what your teachers are going to see. So um, we've been kind of keeping track of the questions as we go. We do thank you for joining us here today. And um, we do hope that you stay well. And please make sure to take care of yourself. And we really um, just want to take this moment to say how much we appreciate and admire the work that you're doing to keep our learners connected and all the children of the LIU footprint. So thank you, everyone. And we hope to hear from you later this week.